of my personal goals for tonight is to avoid saying good morning. So let me practice by saying good evening. It's good to see you guys. I'm so pumped to be a part of here of the Thursday night. This is the first time I've had a chance to be here, and I, I love worshiping with you. I love just the feel of the room. You know, the word family can, can almost be overused when you're talking about the church. Uh, when we gather together with people we don't know, it doesn't feel inappropriate tonight. So I'm very delighted uh, to be here. My name is Michael. I probably have met a decent amount of you. Some of you may, I may not know. Uh, I'm a member of this church, and I'm a part of the teaching team, and I am very, very much looking forward to sharing some thoughts from this kind of strange story uh, from the Gospel of Mark. It's actually found in Matthew and Luke as well. We're just going to look at Mark's version. But before we get to the text, uh, you know, one of the things that I think it's wise to do every now and then is just to kind of pause and to take inventory of your life and specifically to take inventory of what you learned from whom. I learned from my mom that it doesn't make much sense to say you love God if you're never going to open up the Bible and read it for yourself. I learned from my sisters that no one's going to want to play with you if all you ever want to play is the games that you want to play. I learned from my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Dill, that some jokes shouldn't be told because they hurt people. I learned from my baseball coach that if you keep your eye on the ball, you're more likely to make contact. And then from a pastor that the same thing applies when it comes to following Jesus. I learned from my junior high gym teacher that if you call adults bad names, even if it's because they made a horrible call in a basketball game, you're still going to get in big time trouble. (laughs) I learned from my youth minister to always tell the truth because, and I quote, if a man ain't got his word, he ain't got nothing. I learned from a man named A.W. Tozer who died in like 1963, but who wrote a number of books that God is a person and as such a relationship with him can be cultivated as with any person. I learned from one of my college professors that ego and worship simply don't mix and that God loves his church way more than I ever could. You know, in many ways, our our entire thought process is made up of ideas that we learn from somebody else. Parents, teachers, friends, co-workers, pastors, professors, enemies, books, our teachers, if you will, our web of influences. The ideas that we not only allowed into our brain, but the people whose voices, whose thoughts, actually we allowed them to almost become our thoughts. Sometimes it's, it's hard to know like where my thoughts end and where my teacher's thoughts begin or vice versa because we can't even really detect the difference between the two. That's the way mental influence works. That's teaching. I've only shared a few strands from my web of ideas and I've focused obviously on the positive ones. I could share some negative ones, but it would probably be a little bit awkward and I would be trying to be careful not to offend. But you get get the idea and it seems pretty critical to me that at least every now and then we stop and we ask this question. It seems pretty important to me that we stop every now and then and evaluate if 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 the teachers whose voice we've given power in our lives deserve what we've given them. I remember that same professor back in college would always challenge me because anytime I'd like throw out a strong opinion, and if you can believe it, when I was in college, I threw out strong opinions often. Anytime I would just sort of make a claim, he would always say to me, who taught you, who taught you to think like that? And it was this, it was this like fun slash frustrating game we would play because I never knew when he agreed with me and when he didn't. And he rarely like told me actually what he thought, but he was just making me kind of slow down and think about like, where'd you get that idea? that you just stated with such confidence, that you act like you're so sure is true. Where did that come from? And are you sure that you trust the source? And have you thought all these things through? It was a very valuable thing to think through. He was a very good teacher. And it just is wise, I guess we could say it in a simple way, to back up and ask the question, who are my teachers? Who are the people who I've allowed a voice in my life? Who are the people who taught you how to think? And man, in a society like ours, that's, it's very consumer-driven, And and one that's also really technologically advanced, it's like life becomes this competition for attention. And not like you trying to get your parents' attention or your children's attention or your your students' attention or or your spouse's attention. Like other people trying to get your attention. It's like this game to try to get your attention and who's going to win, you know? Because everybody wants you to just look their way for just a moment. Just kind of pay attention to their advertisement or their slogan or what it is that they're offering because they want to try to convince you that they have what you need. That the thing that you're looking for to be happy and satisfied and full is the thing that they're actually offering. You can have it, you know, for the small price of, I don't know, $99 a month or whatever. Just swipe your card. Just give me some time. Just give me some affection. Just give me a little bit of whatever it is I want from you, and then I'll get, I'll give to you what you want from me. And so we find ourselves pulled, I think. Do you feel this way? We find ourselves pulled in, in, in all these different directions by the internet and by social media and by our families and by our friends and by our old friends and by the books that we've read and by the books that we've not read because we don't want to, but everybody keeps telling us we're supposed to, you know. 
And then there's the Bible and the pastor and the church, and it's hard sometimes to navigate our way through this sea of voices. And I don't use that metaphor lightly. That's not a dead metaphor for me. I mean, what is the sea except billions of tiny little droplets of water that have all gathered together into this collective mass it's so hard to see the little pieces from one another? And that's kind of how it feels. There's just this sea of voices coming at us, and we've got to try to decide which ones we're going to listen to. And I think the text that we're studying tonight is, is well, it's kind of designed to help us back up and, and think through who are the voices that I'm giving some power in my life, and, and are they the ones that deserve what it is I'm giving. And really, of course, you know this text is designed to kind of convince us that Jesus' voice should be distinguished from the others and placed alone at the top. I appreciate the reading of the word. I always think it'd be beneficial to read the word twice before we dig into the story. So I'm thankful that I don't have to read it twice. I just get to read it once. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, tune them over to Mark chapter 12. We're going to read that same piece of scripture again. Most of you are probably locked in and paying attention, but let's hear it again. This, this scene where some folks come up to Jesus and ask him a question and he gives them a response. It's a fairly simple story, really. Question, response. But if we dig into the question and response, maybe we'll learn a few things. Here's what it says once more, Mark 12, uh, verse 18. It says, then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. All right, so here's the situation. There were seven brothers, they said, verse 20. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. So at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were not married to her? And Jesus replied, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? See, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. <laughs> now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So what they ask is a fairly simple question, but it's a little bit strange, culturally speaking. You kind of got to know a little bit of the background. There's this practice in the ancient world called leveret marriage. Um, it was called this, uh, it, it, we don't need to get into the term. The term basically means if, you know, if, if in the ancient world there's a man and a woman who are married, then the, you know, it, hopefully they will be married long enough to produce offspring so that the property that that family owns will stay in that property so that the mother herself would be taken care of if something ever happened to the dad, some of these different kinds of things. So in that culture, you know, if, as Deuteronomy 25 is where you can find this in the Bible, if the brother died, then the younger brother was supposed to take care of the woman, take her in and provide her with an heir. That was kind of the idea. And so the Sadducees are asking this kind of practical question. Let's say that the worst happens and that there are seven brothers and that she goes down on through the list and that none of them give her a son. Then, on the other side of things, when we're all raised from the dead, as Jesus believed, but they did not, when we're all raised from the dead, like, who is she going to belong to? Like, whose wife will she be? That's the basic question. But there's a couple of things you need to know about the question because, you know, sometimes questions can be a little bit loaded, you know, especially when it comes to hot button issues. It's like if I said, hey, did you hear that there wasn't a host for the Oscars this year? Like, I'm saying more than just there wasn't a host for the Oscars, you know? Or, or if somebody said, like, what's the big deal with these red hats with the letters M-A-G-A on them? I just don't get it. Well, okay, well, if you, if you understood the context, you'd, you'd get it. And so a lot of times there's more going on than meets the eye with a simple question, and that's what's happening here. Because the Sadducees are some of the Jewish leaders of the day, and really they're some of the more powerful ones. They're the Jewish leaders that are pretty friendly with the Roman Empire, and you don't have to know much about history to know that the Roman Empire was pretty powerful. And so they're kind of at the top of the food chain, so to speak. And, and so they come to Jesus and they ask him this question. And the reason why they ask him this question is they don't believe in the resurrection. It tells us right there in the text. They don't think that the resurrection is a real thing. And the way they defend this is they actually only believe that a portion of the Old Testament is actually the word of God. See, it's mostly in the Psalms and especially in the prophets where you get these, these hints and these statements that point to life after death, that point to a resurrection. But they didn't believe that the Psalms and the prophets were actually scripture. They only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's called the Law of Moses or the Torah. So they only believe in the Torah and therefore they don't believe in the resurrection. So they're coming to Jesus asking this question, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Not because they're curious, but because they want to show that Jesus' belief is silly. That's the idea. 
They're trying to show that it doesn't make any sense based on what the Bible teaches to believe in the resurrection. They're trying to show that at the very core of his program, this idea of being raised up by God is totally ridiculous. And it's a pretty good strategy too. Like if I wanted to hurt the church, I'd go after the resurrection. You know what I'm saying? Like this is the thing at the heartbeat of all this. And so they're going after the very core and they're trying to reduce Jesus' position to absurdity by showing that it actually doesn't hold up to scripture. But Jesus, (laughs) he's as calm as a cucumber. He is not flustered one bit. He's just chill, he's relaxed, he just answers the question, and he does so actually with a little bit of sarcasm. I hope you hear that in his voice when he says to these people who love their Bible so much they only look at portions of it, who have said, no, we know that the rest of that is wrong, this is our thing right here. He says to these people, are you you not in error? Are you not in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? Wow, that's something to say to the teachers. It's like if you were talking to one of the pastors on the way out. Next time, you know, Mark is back, I want you to go up to him on the way out and say, I was listening to your sermon, but I'm a little confused. Like, are you not in error because you don't know the scriptures? You should try that. See how it goes, you know. <laughs> He's a pretty calm guy, so I'm sure it'll be fine. But he'll just, he'll, if you can keep a straight face, he'll, he'll just kind of look at you for a second, and then you'll probably start laughing, and it'll be a good little moment. But that's what Jesus says to these people. Are you not in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? And then he kind of explains what he means. He knocks down their case. He says, first of all, you you don't know the power of God. You don't understand what it is that we're saying God is going to do. When the dead rise, they're neither going to marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. Jesus is saying, look, resurrection isn't just God bringing us back to this world. This world is the one that's all messed up. Why would it be cool if God brought us back to this world? We're saying that God is going to take us to a new world where everything is different. And just so you know that Jesus is being sarcastic, he throws some angels in there because the Sadducees Sadducees didn't believe in angels either. And so he's like, oh, no, no, you have it wrong. Like, in the resurrection, we're going to be like those other things that you don't believe in because you don't actually know the scriptures or the power of God. So Jesus says, first of all, y'all don't really understand the claim that we're making when we talk about the resurrection. It's not just coming back to this life. It's coming back to a new life in a new world altogether. And then he says, not just you don't know the power of God, you don't know the Bible. He goes back to the scriptures. Look at what he says. He says, now about the dead rising, have you not read in, what's the next phrase? The book of Moses. He's like, I'm not going to go to the prophets, which is where you think I'd go to prove that this is true, because I know y'all don't believe in the prophets. I'm not going to go to the Psalms. I'm not going to go to Job. Let's go back to the books that you believe in. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 3, and let's look at what Moses says. Let's look at what the law says, and this is this story. Maybe you've heard of the burning bush. This is this story where, where Moses is walking along, and he's hiding out in the desert because he made a mistake, and he didn't really understand what God wanted him to do, and, and all of a sudden, as he's walking along, this bush is like on fire, but it's not burning up, and so Moses turns aside, and he sees the bush, and he goes to the bush, and God speaks to him through the bush, and it's this crazy story where he's telling Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh, the powerful king, to let my people go, and Moses is like, well, who in the world are you? Like, it's not every day that a bush talks, so I'd like to know your name, and he says, well, my name is Yahweh, which is a fancy way of saying you're going to find out when you get there, but he also says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob right there in the book of the law, right there in the book of Moses. At the moment, really, at the moment when God is calling Moses to go and save the people so that she can actually be a nation, at the moment without which we don't actually have this conversation because the Sadducees don't exist, because Israel doesn't exist. Jesus is going back to this moment at the very core of her history that would no doubt be one of their favorite texts. And he says, look at what God said. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These people who we know aren't actually dead, right? And the God who we know is the God of the living, not the dead. So the problem with you people is you don't actually read the Bible that you say you think you believe in, and therefore you're the ones who are in error because you don't understand the power of God or what the scriptures actually say. And then Jesus, is, his mic drop line is, is as punchy as it is precise. He just says, you are badly mistaken. And then he walks off. So what do we do with this story? Right, like that's the event. That's what happens. Okay. Okay, I don't know. Um, we, we, we wrestle with different issues. You know, and I, I've been asked a lot of questions through the years. I've had a lot of questions of my own. I mean, so far as I know, none of you have ever come up to me and said, so I've got this issue. I've got this guy. He's got seven sons, and then what happened is, you know, it's like not our problem. So what do we do with, the, with, with this strange story of a sarcastic encounter between Jesus and some, some would-be teachers of Israel? 
<laughs> you know, people usually come to this text with curiosities about marriage and eternity. I'm sure you've heard the cheesy preacher joke about the, you know, there's three ways to make sure that people pay attention, three topics that are always going to get people to come to church. You can talk about sex, you can talk about the afterlife, you can talk about whether there's going to be sex in the afterlife. Like, those are the three, you know. <laughs> and so we usually come to this, this, uh, this text wondering, so what exactly are you saying about marriage, Jesus? You know what I mean? Like, because it seems a little strange. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I, I thought this text was going to be a little bit more about marriage and, and such things. I, I, I preached somewhere else earlier this week, and, and the, 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 the sermon assignment there was a theology of sexuality and marriage. And so I remember looking at these two thinking, oh, cool, like these are going to kind of overlap a little bit. This is going to be great. And then I studied this text, and I'm like, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> because this text isn't actually about marriage. Now, it does reveal some important truths, I think, that marriage is primarily, especially the the sort of legal relationship we describe as marriage is primarily for for this phase of our existence, that there are some important ways in which marriage is a temporary thing, that it it points forward to something beyond itself. Now, there are a lot of questions that that leaves open, right? Like, to what extent and how that's all going to work out? I'm as curious as you are, but I don't think we'd be paying close attention to this text if we pressed it too much for details on that question. In the end, this text is not about marriage, but it's about whether or not you should follow Jesus. That's what this text is about. This text is about whether or not you should let his voice trump all of the competitors. Does he deserve the authority that he asks you to give him? That's the question. And I'm sure we have a spectrum in this room of of spirituality. Some of you have been following Jesus for a long time. This text has something to say to you. Some of you are just you're, you're just checking this out. Somebody invited you to come to church, and you're like, I don't like Sundays. And they were like, gotcha, we have church on Thursdays, you know. <laughs> and so you, you kind of got sucked in, and here you are, and we're so glad you're here. And a lot of what we do is really weird, and a lot of what I say is probably going to sound really weird, and that's okay. But there's something in this, in this text for you as well, because Jesus is actually also in the room. I know that's real weird, speaking of weird. He's out also in the room, and he is, um, let me say this too, like if, you know, we all get snowed in on Sunday, and this is the sermon on Facebook Live, whatever room you're in there, not live, but you know what I mean, He's in that one too. Like he's always in the room. And when we, when we talk through the scriptures, he's always inviting us to allow him to have authority in our lives. And the whole, po- I think the whole point of the story is just to give us some time to pause and ask, should we give it to him? Should we, should we let him actually be the one who, who, who really is our teacher? That's the question. Did you, did you notice how they approached Jesus? You might have not seen it. We don't really pay attention to all the details sometimes because there's always so much But the Sadducees come up to him with a question, and they said, teacher. It's right there in the text. It's the ninth of 12 times in the Gospel of Mark that you see the word teacher, and none of them are straightforward. They're all sort of ironic. They're all spoken in a context where you can't really tell if the people who are saying it actually want him to be their teacher or not. And I think that's part of the point. Do you call him teacher? And if you call him teacher, do you want him to be your teacher? And here at this point in the gospel, again, we've been looking at, and Matthew and, Matthew and Mark and Luke all have the same chunk of stories. Is there's, this, there's this succession of encounters that Jesus has with the Pharisees and the Herodians and then with the Sadducees and then after this with the teacher of the law. There's these conversations that Jesus is having with these different people. Most of them are fairly hostile. Most of them are fairly sarcastic back and forth. We looked last week at the one about the whole idea of, you know, should you pay taxes or should you not? And these, these, these questions are designed to trap Jesus to show that he's probably not a person you should trust. And the whole point of this section of scripture is for you to recognize that there's always going to be multiple voices who are saying to you, here's the way to go. Here's the truth about the universe. Here's the path to lasting happiness. Here's what you should do. And the purpose of these passages is to help us back up and recognize this is still going to be true today, and it's designed to help us ask the question, will you let Jesus be your teacher? I always appreciate this question, and not just because I'm a teacher. (laughs) I I don't think this is the first thing that comes to mind when we think about Jesus. Maybe that's okay. I think if I said, like, who is Jesus, or said, fill in the blank, Jesus is my what? Most of us would say, like, Jesus is my, I don't know, what would you say? Holler it out. We're close here. Savior. Lord. Yeah, those are the two most com- prominent ones. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Maybe he's my friend. I think I heard that out there somewhere. Right? Like, so these are the things that come to mind, and absolutely fine and good. Wonderful. These are critical titles. Savior and Lord are the two most important ones, right? But I think you also should have toward the top of your list, Jesus is my teacher. He is my teacher. He is, he is the one who... Well, his words guide my life. Will you let his words guide your life? That's the question. Will you organize your life around convictions that you learned from him? 
Think of it this way. Will, will you allow his values to be your values? The things that are important to him, are you, are you willing to, to increasingly let those same things become important to you? Will you take on his mindset? Will you live in such a way that the answer to the question, who taught you to think like that, is most often Jesus? And we've seen this concept come up multiple times as we've walked through the gospel, sometimes of me up here, sometimes of Mark. I always love the question, but I always want to ask, what's the unique angle that each text gives us on this question? What's the unique angle that comes from this story? A couple of things, actually. First, I'm going to do real quick, because the third one is the main thing I want to leave you with. There's two don'ts and a do, so I'll do the don'ts as fast as I can. First thing I think comes out of this story is, don't assume that you would do better, like than the Sadducees. Don't assume that if you were in the, con- in, in the situation, if you were in the story, don't assume that if you were the one asking the question that you'd do a better job than they did. I realized um, in, in reading through this passage uh, in preparation for this that when I've read this story, I usually find myself in one of two places. Usually I'm like an, just an onlooker. I'm like an innocent bystander just kind of checking out the action. But then when I'm not, like if I'm not just sort of, a, if I want to like find myself in the characters who are there, I'm one of the disciples, it's like, yeah, get them, Jesus. Yeah, I love it when you do that. Ah, those people are so dumb. You're so smart, Jesus. Yeah. But I realized I never see myself as the Sadducee. I never stop and, like, put myself in that position. I never, I never ask, what if I'm the Sadducee? So what if I'm the Sadducee? What if, what if, what if, what if you're the Sadducee? And I think my favorite slash least favorite thing about this particular story is that it just it kind of cuts to the quick. It cuts to the heart of the issue. You'll miss it if you're not looking for it. Comes twice, though. Jesus' reply starts and finishes the same way. First thing out of his mouth is, are you not in error? Last thing out of his mouth is, you are badly mistaken. There's two different words in the English. It's the same word in the original Greek. Are you not in error? Oh, you are badly in error. Are you not mistaken? Oh, you are badly mistaken. That's the question, man. That's, that's the question. That's the uncomfortable question. What am I going to do when Jesus says to me, are you not in error? You are badly mistaken. What are you going to do when Jesus says to you, are you not in error? You are badly mistaken. And it's like, well, of course, if Jesus came in the room and said, you need to change your thinking on this, you need to change your living, I would do it. It's like, duh. Like, well, really? Would I? Would you? I don't know. It's like church history is littered with these stories of people who didn't. You know what I'm saying? Like, we all know the the, the ugly ones. We all know the, the crusades and some of these different things. We all probably know that in Nazi Germany, there were a lot of Christians that went along with it for a long time. We probably all know that, you know, and like the, the KKK had a lot of people who claimed to be Jesus followers in this. And you look at these, maybe these are silly examples because they're so dramatic. And maybe we're not in danger of these things. I don't know, but somebody is, right? And I think at least we got to ask the question, like, how is it that so many people could, could think that they were the disciples but actually be the Sadducees? And maybe it is because we just flat out ignore Jesus. Maybe it is because we know what he says. Maybe it is because we dig into the Gospels and we, like, see what he says, but we just don't do it. I don't know. I think it's probably more so. We just conveniently do ignore, right? It's like somebody who's flying down the street and 100 miles an hour everywhere he goes. You get pulled over. Why are you going so fast? Well, I would have gone the speed limit if I'd have known what it was. Well, there's signs on the side of the road, brother. You know what I mean? Like, that doesn't work. You got no excuse. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that when I get to Jesus... I mean, in the end, grace covers it, but there's a part of me that's afraid, like, that he's going to look at me and he's like, Michael, why didn't you, like, why, why didn't you pay attention to this part? Oh, I didn't even realize that was there. You have no excuse, buddy. Man, I don't know. I don't want to be the Sadducee, but I need to be careful not to assume that I would do better. They're certainly not the last people to roll their eyes at Jesus. Anyway, you get the point. Number two, don't rely on past faithfulness. I think sometimes, and this is, and I'm not coming after us. If those of you who are in the room who are like checking this out, I'm not coming after you. Like, right? Like, you're not the one claiming to be a follower of Jesus. Not yet. You know? I'm talking to those who are in. That last one and this one, I think for those who've been doing this for a bit, it's really easy to be like, well, yeah, of course I'm, a, of course I'm interested in following Jesus. Like, I've been following Jesus for a long time. I say that all the time. I've been with him for a long time. Okay. Okay. So one time I said yes to Jesus. What about like today, right? Like what about now? And, and here, here's why I think that's what's, some of what's going on in this passage is, it's like we said before, this, this isn't, I actually didn't say this yet, this isn't the first time we've seen Jesus get into one argument after another with the Jewish religious teachers in the gospel. Like we're right now in Mark chapter 12, 
And in Mark chapters 11 and 12, he gets in these series of conversations with the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees shows up and the teachers of the law. Way, way back in Mark chapter 2, he got into some conversations with the Pharisees and with the Herodians and with the teachers of the law. He kind of set them up, knock them down. So he set them up, knock them down early, and he sets them up, knocks them down late. And I look at this, and, and you kind of take a global view of this, and you're like, why are you repeating it? Why is it in here again? Like I thought earlier, we, we dealt with the issue of whether or not we trust in Jesus as opposed to the other people. And I think there's something there. I, see there, I think there's something to saying, it, it's not okay for me to just be able to point back to a time when I said, yes, Jesus is the one I'm going to follow. Because things happen, like the situation changes. In the Gospel of Mark, that was, that was a long time ago. That was before Jesus said anything about going to the cross, much less taking us with him. And I think for us, it's like, yeah, we said yes to Jesus because we realize that he promises to give us the very best life possible. And I actually think he does. I think Jesus provides you with the, with the most reliable path to lasting happiness. Little question in my mind that that is the case. And so we say yes to Jesus because he's going to make our life better. But then over time, it's like, wow, this is a strange definition of better, Jesus. <laughs> like, I didn't realize there was going to be so much, so much waiting and, and so much suffering on this road to better. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this anymore. I think it's really important to be honest about the times when we're looking at Jesus saying, I'm not sure about this anymore. The other option is to act like it's not actually taking place. I'm not sure, Jesus. I think I got time to tell you this story. This is one of the, I may have told you before, it's, it's a story that haunts me. It's about two brothers named Clarence and Robert Jordan. They lived in the middle of, of the last century in the South. And um, uh, Robert Jordan was a, was a lawyer, a budding lawyer who was kind of looking forward to a career in politics at the time. And, and Clarence was uh, was younger brother. He was... Um, he was a pastor, but not just like a pastor, like he led this community of people who lived on these farms and they kind of took care of each other and it was a time of deep racial tension, you know, middle of the last century in the South and, and his community was committed to the gospel and so they recognized the gospel means that no matter whether you're black, white or whatever, like we're gonna live together under the lordship of Christ and, and there were a lot of people at the time who didn't like that and who had a big problem with that and so they would harass them and they would burn their farms and they would just do all sorts of things to them and so eventually Clarence goes to his brother Robert and says, big brother, I need your help, man. Like, these people are doing this stuff to us, and it is not okay, and I need you to use some of your, your clout. I need to use some of this legal power that you have to get us some protection. And, and Robert says, man, I love what you're doing, bud. Like, I think it's super cool, and, and I agree with it and all, but, but you, know my, you know I can't do that. You know I can't put my name on what you're doing. You know my political aspirations that would totally ruin my career. And Clarence is like, but you know that this is the right thing to do. And he's like, yeah, I know it's the right thing to do, but that's kind of not the point in this situation. And Clarence said, that's exactly the point in this situation. And he said, I remember, I remember when we were young boys. I remember we walked down the aisle the same Sunday. And we walked up front and we told the pastor we want to be baptized because we want to be followers of Jesus. And we got in the water and we were baptized and we made the great confession. Like, I remember, man, I was there with you when you said this. When you said that you were going to follow Jesus. And, and his older brother, Robert, said, yeah, buddy, yeah, I follow Jesus. Up to a point. And Clarence is like, could that point by any chance be the cross? And he said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I follow Jesus up to the cross, but I'm not getting up on it. I'm not getting myself crucified. He said, I think you need to go to your church then and tell them that you're no longer a Christian. To tell them that you're no longer a follower of Jesus because you have decided that it has just gotten too difficult, too hard, too costly for you. Man, you can't rely on past faithfulness. I can't rely on past faithfulness. I can't assume that because I listened to Jesus in the past, I'm listening to Jesus right now. But I really don't think that the primary thrust of this text is to warn us. That's there. That's implicit. I think the primary purpose of this text is to impress us, if I'm being honest. That's what I think is going on. So let me give you the third thing, and this is what I want us to kind of camp out in. I want you to walk away with. I want you to take note of Jesus' superior intelligence. It's kind of a strange thing to say, but I want you to pay attention to this. Take note of Jesus' superior intelligence I think the proper response to what's going on in the story is actually showed in the next text. We're going to unpack it next week. There's this man who who's sees that Jesus offered a good answer, and then he goes up, and he's the first one to ask Jesus a sincere, honest question. He was impressed with Jesus. I think that's the point is if you understand what's going on here, you will find yourself impressed with Jesus. You will realize that this Jesus person is no joke, and not just because he's full of love and power. Not just because he's really strong and really compassionate. These things are true. Man, they are wonderfully true. And I feel like, at least for me, 
I don't know what's been the theme for you. The theme for me, in a lot of ways, of this years-long process we've been walking through the Gospels, as I've heard Mark mostly teach through these texts, the thing that keeps coming up is Jesus is thoroughly loving, and he is thoroughly powerful, and that's why you can trust him. And I think that those things are wonderfully true. And this text is about that you can trust him, but it's actually not about love or power. He doesn't really show radical love to someone in need. He doesn't really demonstrate some sort of great power. No, that's not what's going on here. What we see here is that there's a third point that's kind of added to the trifecta. Jesus is the most loving person in the universe. Jesus is the most powerful person that you will ever meet. And Jesus is the most intelligent person who has ever lived. That's what's going on in this text. If this text is designed to prove that Jesus deserves our ear whenever and on whatever topic he speaks, the the rationale for that, the reason for that that's provided here is that he's smarter than you. He's smarter than them. He's smarter than everybody. Now, I realize that it would be super boring for most of you if we, like, walk through all of the different ways that Jesus finds logical inconsistencies in what the Sadducees said. We're not going to. Don't worry. Fellow nerds of the world, you can trace these things out for yourselves. I just want you to notice. I just want you to notice that while Jesus is never a cold person or never an uncaring person, we see in this passage a deeply logical mind exposing the flaws in the arguments of his opponents. I don't think we're trained to think about Jesus as a brilliant person, and I think we suffer for it. Bottom line, not the bottom line that tells you guys to get up. You guys stay there. Like, the the heart of this is, like, if you don't think that Jesus is the most intelligent person in the world, I don't think you're going to follow him with your life. Can I say that again? If you don't think that Jesus is the most intelligent person alive, I don't think you're going to hand him the reins. You just won't. You just won't. And you got to think this through because it's like certain people, we give authority over a part of our lives. We give a voice over part of our lives, say so over a portion. So like you, you let the doctor have authority over the, the health part of your life. Why? Because the doctor knows more than anybody else that you have access to. And so you listen to him or her. You give your teachers, like your math teacher or your science teacher, you give them authority. You give their voice authority when it comes to matters of math and science, how numbers work and, and how the, kind of the world unfolds and whatever. Why? Because they have more information. They're the most intelligent people that you know on, on these topics are the most intelligible ones that you have access to. And so you trust them with a part of your lives. But Jesus does and just come saying, hey, I'd like to lead a part of your lives. We treat him like he does. Like he just, I want to handle the religious part. Jesus never says that he wants to handle the religious part. This is the crazy thing about Jesus is he says, I want all of it. I want everything. Every single piece. Not like Jesus is going to tell you how to diet or like whether to buy a Ford or a Nissan, you know, like not those, although there may be some principles that even apply there. I don't know. But the point is like there's this umbrella now over your life that Jesus invites you to live under. And the umbrella is my voice is the one that you follow. My truth is the one that you believe. My convictions are the ones that you lean into. My my mindset is the one that you imitate. And biblically speaking, this is what the heart is or the mind is. Jesus wants your heart, your mind. And it's not like he wants the inside of you as opposed to the outside of you. He wants the inside of you because the inside governs the outside. He wants your core. He wants to capture your heart. And he wants to convince your mind that he is the one that you can trust. I think about another favorite passage of mine from the New Testament, Colossians chapter 2, where Paul says, my goal is that these people, you, the followers of Jesus, will be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We always come to Jesus with questions, which is fine, like we're supposed to. That's how it works. But if we don't believe that he's the smartest, wisest person in the world, and when we receive from him an answer, and by receive from him, I don't mean that like an idea magically drops down from heaven. I mean you read something in the scriptures, or you hear something in church, or in life group, or from a wise spiritual friend, and you just, there's something different. Like you just know in that moment, like God is addressing you. If you're not convinced that he's the most intelligent person in the world, then when he says no, you're going to be like, I think I'm going to go with yes. Or when he says yes, you're going to be like, ah, but I can think of a lot of good reasons why I should say no. Or when he says, here's the truth, or here's the path to follow, you're going to think to yourself, I'd kind of like to lead this one myself, or I I heard somebody else's idea, and their idea seems like the one that I should listen to. And bottom line, if you, if you're not prepared to give Jesus control over every portion of your life, then you will be like the Sadducees in this story. And if you do not think that he is intelligent, then you will not give him control over every portion of your life. No one's asking you to be perfect. I'm not, Jesus is not. 
We may not even know the different parts of our lives that are not surrendered to him, but the idea is that I consistently come back to this point where I say over and over, maybe in my own mind or maybe out loud, Jesus, I'm going to listen to you on this one. Jesus, I'm going to seek out your will on this one. Jesus, I want you to know what you would have me do in this situation, and when I figure it out, that's what I'm going to do. And today, tonight, we remember, we remind ourselves from this passage that this decision is a sensible one because Jesus is always smarter than me. So, if there's any portion of your life that you're holding on to, again, if there's any portion of your life that you're holding on to, one more time, if there's any portion of your life that you're holding on to and saying, I think I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna handle this, I'm gonna go with what that person said, look, you can do that. Like, that's certainly an option for us in this life. But I wouldn't recommend it because Jesus is the most intelligent person who ever lived, and that's the guy whose voice always deserves to win. Father God, we're grateful for this strange little story and for the chance to gather as a group of imperfect people who want to be closer to you or at least are interested in what it might mean to be closer to you. And so take the words and to do something with them, Take the ideas and, and impress them deeply into our minds and hearts. Help us to help us to listen with every part of us. For your blessing over the rest of our evening, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.